Hi, my name's Scott, the Miniature Maniac, and today we're going to resume work on my Crystal Brush entry, Homecoming. What up, Mini Family? We got about 10 or 11 weeks until Crystal Brush happens. Now, that may seem like a lot of time, but in the grand scheme of things, it really isn't. So, we gotta start on this entry. First things first, we need some wood. Walk with me. Welcome to my wood storage area. Now you might not see a lot of stuff, but over here are the sheet goods like plywood and sheets of MDF and whatnot. And over here is just random wood. We got some maple right here. We got some pine right here and whatever the frick this is. So for wood for plinths, which miniatures sit on, a lot of people like to use really fancy wood because I think fancier the wood, the better the whole thing looks and I should be good to go. But generally speaking, when it comes to plinths, I like to paint my plinths black. I don't want them to draw attention. So that being said, we're gonna use cheap wood like pine. All right, for the wood, we're gonna use this pine. It's a three by three. I bought it from Home Depot a long time ago when I made my first board game table. We're just gonna cut a slab off this and try to square it up. I've got a little blank right here, and now we're going to cut it down to its final width. And for crystal brush, if you remember, 60 mil width was the widest that we could do. You know, now that I see this 60 mil right here, that doesn't seem too small. I remember being concerned about this being too small of an area, but this, this, this gives me confidence. Now I will say that I don't feel the safest cutting a blank like this end grain to end grain on a miter saw, but I'm gonna go slow and keep my fingers far away from the blade, so just don't watch if you're scared, okay? Now we got a little 60 mil blank. So now we're going to angle in the sides a little bit. So instead of being a square, it is going to be more of a rhombus to kind of draw the viewer into the center of the diorama and the background, which will be the face of a church. Now it's kind of angled in. And now we're gonna cut it to length. All right, and now we got a nice little blank for our base. Is it perfectly square? Probably not, but as long as it sits flat and looks relatively flat, it doesn't really matter. I'm just gonna take the edge off some of these corners um, so it's nicer to hold, not so sharp. Now is the important step of bringing all the sawdust into the finished part of your basement and getting it everywhere to make your wife mad. Okay, onto the real next part. This is wood, and when you paint wood black, it raises the grain, and you can see the grain of the plinth. I don't want to be able to see the grain of the plinth when this model is all finished. And so I want to start to smooth down this grain so it's a nice black object. You can't see that it's wood. Now my concern is, is that when I've built a bunch of things on top of this, it's going to be somewhat scary to have to sand the sides of these blocks in an aggressive way. Maybe there are details that are hanging over and stuff like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to smooth down the grain first before building anything on top of it. And all of this is going to be painting the sides with black craft paint, letting it dry, with a hair dryer and then sanding it down and just repeating that process until when I touch it and feel it, I can feel no more grain. And if I paint it, I can't see any more grain either. I did a pretty similar process, but with a cylinder in my Heavy Metal Marines Imperial Fists video. While I stand for an eternity, let me talk to you about a cool Kickstarter by the name of Battle Effects by a company called Deadly Print Studios. Miniature Wargamers have an issue with lack of immersion in their games. Now, some things that help with immersion are playing with painted and based miniatures, playing on a table with a lot of cool terrain, but there's still one problem. Our characters exist in a war-torn universe with arrows whizzing by your ears, poisonous glass shards flying at high velocities through the air, and super hot plasma that is destroying tanks left and right. But that damage often goes not represented. When you kill a tank, 
You just take it off the table. It's kind of anticlimactic. Well, your days of immersion lacking blue balls are over. The guys over at Deadly Print Studios have launched a Kickstarter called Battle Effects that is all about 3D models for you to print at home on your 3D printers to represent explosions of all kinds of different sizes, muzzle flashes that can attach to your weapons, destructible terrain, orbital bombardments, and so much more. My personal favorite is the large smoke plume that's transparent so you can put a light inside of it for added glowing effect. I also like the in-progress Tau battle shield that you can print with transparent filament to look like something is impacting the shield mid-battle. The quality of the print will obviously vary based on what kind of technology you use to print the models. For my personal pieces, I used PLA, but if you were to use a resin printer, these would come out looking just like the 3D models. These little additions are fun ways to spice up the narrative element of your miniature war games. The Kickstarter ends February 15th at 11 a.m. CST, but if you happen to miss the campaign, you can also pledge late on their website. Both the Kickstarter and their site are linked in the description below if you are interested. Thanks for supporting YouTubers, Deadly Print Studios. All right, let's get back to the build. Here it is all sanded up and nice and smooth. You can still see some of the grain right here. There's also some little bits and bobs of debris kind of attached there, but we can get that off with a final sanding. This is good for an initial uh, pass. Now that we've finished up with the plinth of our base here, we're going to start working on the back of it, which is going to be the face of a church. And we need inspiration for that. So, to Google. Okay, so I'm kind of drawn towards wooden churches versus things like stone. I like the idea of it being old and rickety. Um, some things that are discernibly old churchy are very skinny windows and also a, a circular window above the main entrance. Um, a lot of them have either a recessed front entrance or an entrance that is kind of pushed out more. So I have all these ideas kind of floating in my head, and now the question is, is what am I going to do? And I need to marinate with these ideas. I, I feel almost weird because I don't like to listen to podcasts or music a whole lot when I'm, you know, walking my dogs or driving to work. I like to think about things, and this is the example of one thing that I might think about. It's like, what do I want this thing to look like, given all of these images that I've already looked at? So, let's get juicy. Before we do any of the design elements, though, we need to put a nice back on the thing to build everything on top of. We're going to cut the rectangle to be the maximum height that Crystal Brush allows for, which is 75 millimeter. And then we're just gonna super glue it on and use a very expensive weight to hold it down. Now the next thing I think I wanna do is pin the back onto the wood because this is gonna be the platform that all my terrain is built upon. Like how tragic would it be if it just fell off? So we're going to pin it in four corners and in the center just to make sure that it's really stuck there. And then we'll fill the gaps in between the backboard and also of the little nail heads uh, with some milliput. And then sand about 99% of it away. I decided to go for a design that was protruding out toward the viewer. Um, and so now I need to find some kind of material to bulk up the front of my shirt so that I can start building on top of it. Now a good candidate for this would be the typical pink insulation foam that's high density and cuts nicely. But I don't have any that is the right thickness for this particular scenario. Um, so a long time ago, the company sent me some black, I think it's cosplay foam for the most part. It's also high density, but it's squishy. Um, and I'm gonna give that a shot. So I have the right thickness material that I think I like for it. So I'll cut out a rectangle and stick it to my plastic card. Uh, I kind of struggle to cut the foam in a straight way uh, with my little right angle, machinist's right angle. And what ended up just giving me the best results was just using a normal ruler and measuring it out beforehand. Um, one small note, I used some extra thin super glue to kind of attach this permanently uh, to the sides of the uh, styrene, and it was causing it to melt a little bit, and I could see vapors coming off of it. So if you're gonna do this, just make sure that you're wearing some kind of ventilation so you're not breathing in those harmful fumes. I actually used the super glue to harden the edge of the foam so I could sand it down uh, to flush with the top of my diorama. I'm just sitting here trying to think about what would be the best way to do this. 
Is it best to put the siding on first and then carve the door out of the siding? Is it best to put the, the door on first and then put the siding on around it? That'd make the siding more inconvenient but make the door easier. There are so many little ways that you could just vary the order in which you would do this creative process. And I'm not necessarily sure which one is best. It's tough. A lot of things to marinate about. Juicy. In the typical fashion of me, while thinking about what to do for some other detail, I decided to add another detail to my diorama. I figured I would slant the foam section of the roof here so that I could put shingles on top of this little section and continue the siding all the way up. Like this is a small little outcropping of the building. But I gave the door some more thought. And I think the right way to go about it is to build the door first and then make the siding around it. So we need to do some math first to make sure we get an accurate door size here. So typical doors here um, are about 80 inches in height. 80 inches is the international residence code for entrance doors. So about 80 inches in height. Now a typical human being is maybe six foot tall. Now in our world, a typical human being is 28 millimeter tall. So we need to make all three of these different units the same units and then figure out what X should be. All right, so the door needs to be approximately 31 millimeters high in order for it to be accurate to what a 28 mil scale model's universe looks like. And this little outcropping here is you know, it's like 68 mil high. So we have plenty of space for a door and then extra details above it. Um, you know, that doesn't necessarily seem entirely right. You know, judging of what the size of my model is and judging uh, about how high 32 mil is, that doesn't seem, <laughs> that doesn't seem right. So let's quick look up what the scale of Malifaux is. 32 mil, okay, so it's not 28 right here. This should be 32. 35 mil for a door. That seems a little bit better. You know what? We're just gonna we're just gonna go safe and we're gonna do 40 mil just to make it look bigger and grander. All right, let's do the same thing for the width. Times it by two because I want to have two doors and then see how it fits here in the foam. All right, so the width of a door in a 32 mil scale world is about 16 mil. So if I double that up for two doors, that's 32 mil wide. It, again, it doesn't seem big enough, but maybe the width can be like larger than a normal human being and maybe a little bit more imposing because of that. So a car rectangle that's 32 mil wide and 35 mil high, strike a line down the middle and then kind of make that line deeper with a triangle file. And then I want to distress this styrene because I want it to look like wood and I want it to look like worn wood. But it's very difficult to do that in a way that is actually to scale, to make wood grain to scale in, in a 32 mil scale. Um, so we're just going to admit the fact that we're not going to be able to do that. And we'll start hitting it with a wire brush, which doesn't really seem to be doing anything. So next, I'm going to try an awl, just scraping it with an awl. That seems to be working a lot better, so we'll, we'll sand it to get rid of the fuzzies and maybe hit it with a wire brush to do, do some very, very small lacerations. After the main door part is sufficiently scratched up, we're going to put some trim on the door to make it look a little bit more ornate. One thing about making your structures look a little bit cooler is if you have different size and widths of uh, styrene, that diversity can kind of give your building or structure more visual interest. If you use the same piece of styrene for like everything on the building, it can seem a little monotonous. I glued those pieces down longer than they needed to be and then fit the smaller pieces of trim in between them and then trimmed and sanded everything to size. Next, I wanted people to know that this was a church, not by just guessing by its architecture. So I ended up putting a cross on the door. I didn't really have anything that was to scale. It could be the right cross size. So I used these old track pins that I bought for a project. For the door handle itself, I attached it to the door via drilling holes into the door for layout. I used the track pins again for the pieces that attach the door handle itself to the door. And then I used a larger piece of brass for the door handle, making sure to sand the edges off so you'd get rid of that pinched look that using clippers leaves when you when you clip out brass. I took a small amount of milliput and then put it on the cross just to kind of hide the divide between the horizontal and vertical members. So the door still looks a little bit too small. So I have a Malifaux figure here that we can use for size comparison. And yeah, very clearly the door is too small. <laughs> 
this guy would hit his head if he was standing at full height walking through this door, and I don't get the impression that he's particularly big in the Malifaux universe. He's kind of a weaselly little guy. So the door's too small, so now the question is, what do you do? Do you redo this because it's competition, you want everything to be perfect? You know, as I paint more and more, I kind of care less and less, <laughs> which is a bad thing and a good thing. You know, as a background detail, I'm kind of okay just slapping this on there. People might say that it's not the right scale. Is it going to be easy to tell when you have the witch on the cross as the only point of reference, kind of higher up above the background? I'm not sure. You know, in the spirit of everything looking perfect, I think we're going to redo the door. And that's where we're going to end this video, guys, with one failed tiny man's door and a larger, more appropriately sized door. If you want to see the first episode in this series where I plan out the diorama and also talk about considerations for entering into a competition like Crystal Brush, you can find a link to it in the top right hand corner of the screen right now. If you like the channel and you want to support it, you can find links in the description to do that, namely a Patreon campaign with a bunch of fun rewards like a Discord server where you can hang out with me and chat any day of the week or a merchandise store where you can buy t-shirts with my logo on it and also an Amazon affiliate shopping that you can use while shopping on Amazon. Subscribe or die! And most importantly, don't forget to... Do what? To paint minis? <laughs> to paint the minis? Hey, man!